Peace. Namaste, everybody. Um, I left the bell over there because it's full of bird seeds for the chickadees. Namaste and peace and welcome to Not Church. I'm Peter Panagor. Today, we're talking about Thomas 19. My title is, what is my title? You lived before. That's my title. You lived before. You are a temporary human being. Your origin is divine. The process of meditation is the redivinization of yourself. Not so much your soul gets redefined as a divine, but your human self gets expressed as divinity embodied. First, I'll say hi to Jack, who I didn't say hi to, and dog-faced pony soldier in New Mexico, and Maggie in Glasgow. We are an international crowd this morning. Thank you for being here. A word about the conference last week, and... It was fascinating. There were atheist speakers and human who are humanists and atheist attenders, and it was this good cross section of uh, history and research into mysticism and near death experience and ancient texts by a professor. And I was the ringer of spirituality. I was the I was the 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 near death experiencer. Um, and it was just fascinating, and I'll tell you more about that some other time, maybe at Mystic Tea Salon today, the top of the hour at 11 o'clock. So building on last week's pre-recorded talk about Jesus and my heavenly viewpoint that our beginning is our ending and how our ending is our beginning in Thomas 18, today it's Thomas 19, and this is what we read. Jesus said, Blessed is he, the man, the one, the person who was before he, she came into being. Blessed is the one who was before they came into being. If you exist as my disciples and listen to my words the, with the ear of your heart, then these stones will minister to you. For you have five trees in paradise which do not change, either in summer or winter, and their leaves do not fall. He who knows them shall not taste death. Dun, dun, dun. But first, let's do what he would want us to do by making our eyes single so that our bodies can be filled with light energy. If this is your first time here, welcome. We chant three ohms aloud and then drop inside the temple of our hearts into centering uh, a place of centering prayer through meditation. Pick a prayer word, maybe love, write it on your breath, and when your mind wanders, return your, to your breath and to your word and use your third eye and your second chakra, which is just below your belly button, as anchors. Friends, Let's touch into the silence at the top and the bottom of our breaths. And after the word stops and your breath has ended, just stay there like this. Just stop a beat. Practicing this together and on your own deepens our collective journey. Where two or more are gathered, I am there. The multiplier. So. If you want to know more about how to do this, there's a link below in the description with instructions on centering prayer. All right, my friends, thanks for joining me. Say hi to everybody else who's, who's here. Lynn and T. Barb, Courtney, Kitney, Kitya, what a kidney, Kitya, uh, Valerie, Michael, and Brother Ed. Hey, brothers. All right, my friends, let's uh, join together in our silent. Hey, Kettle, Bella Misa, and Art. All right, let's join in together three ohms and then dropping into centering prayer. Center into centering prayer.
You lived before you died. Thomas 19. Jesus said, Blessed is the one who was before they came into being. Is this a humble brag? You know, everything that Jesus says, it comes out of his own experience. He's not talking, he's talking, let me say how he is talking rather than how he's not. He's talking as a mystical experiencer. We've talked a lot about mysticism here. We've talked about how you have mystical experiences and what they are. And if you don't know what they are, you can go back and look in the earlier videos. We talk a lot about it, especially in the last a year ago or so. Mystical experiences are what Jesus had in order to have the wisdom that he has had. So I could ask this question. When he's talking about being before coming into being, he says, Blessed is the one who was before, blessed am I who was before I came into being. Is that what he's saying? Blessed is I who was before I came into being? I think so. This Jesus is talking about his personal experience. Would he say such a thing and emphasize it to his disciples? If that's what he wanted to tell them, of course he would. If, if this is true for, the, for him, it's true for all of us. And of course, he had trouble giving the ineffable message because he's speaking in metaphor. So it, it, show me your face before you were born, is the famous Zen saying. Show me your face before you were born. This is very similar to this. I think Jesus is talking about his own experience. And I hear him saying, blessed am I, a human being who remembers my higher self, my original self, and who I was before I incarnated into this life. I remember myself. Did he remember his higher self? Oh, I think so. And told us so. Theologians, okay, Christian theologians agree with this. And John 1 Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the prologue, in the origin, I'm going to read it to you in a little different bit of language here. In the origin, there was the word that carried an idea, and the logos was Allah, and the word was with Allah. Okay, before you get freaked out here, Allah is the Arabic word for God. And that's the one they use in Palestine in Christian churches. So, cool it with the word thing. I'm going to read this again. Don't attach to the words. The, the, the words aren't the thing itself. It's really about the energetic flow. Jesus is having such a difficult time communicating this all through the Gospel of Thomas because it's almost impossible to talk about. You can experience it. You can feel it. You can feel the flow inside of you, in the palms of your hand, in your third eye, in your second chakra. You can feel it in your kundalini awakening. It's all of these things and more. The chi ball. Okay, back to Peter, back on task. In the origin, there was the word that carried an idea. And the logos was Allah, and the word was with Allah. Was and was with was Allah and was with Allah, was and was with whole beingness in oneness and outside of, with and was with, was Allah and was with Allah, is the oneness and is outside the oneness. This, someone in Facebook this, yesterday posted up, do you know, is your soul, is your consciousness, asking near-death experiencers, is, was your consciousness in heaven always in existence? And the answer is yes and no. I said almost always, not wanting to get into what I'm going to talk about today as serendipity would have it. So, was Allah, I was in the divine self and I was with it outside of it. Was and was with whole beingness in oneness, the capital O, and outside of with a capital O. Paradox. Always the paradox. To theologians, the prologue of John is the expressive Jesus in particular. Okay, this is where they differ. In 
Theologians believe this. They think this. The prologue of John is the expressly the express property of Jesus in particular specialness as the only one, the one and only, the only word, the only Christ, instead of the Christ consciousness which he was talking about. Which is not what we hear him saying in Thomas. We don't hear him saying, I am the one, I am the only one, there are no others but me. That's not what he says. That's not what he says. What he says is blessed is the one who was before they were born, or words to that effect, which includes you and me. In Thomas, Jesus uses the second person, which serves, and he says, blessed is the one, and it's somebody else, it's not just me, it's not really humble bragging here, he's talking about another person, another being. So he's in the second person which serves a double purpose for us and for him, as it allows others to be like him. He gets to claim this for himself in a humble way, and he gets to give it away. In this case, the second person is a bridge between his Christ consciousness and his original nature and ours, in our original nature in the goodness of the origin of ourselves. And all the stuff we talked about over the last year and all those videos and all that stuff when we did the demythologizing, this thing is there. Remember back to this, what we talked about back then, the Crystal River and all of that. We too are pre-existent we forget here. There's a veil here. We're blind here. We can't see here. And when I say we can't see here, I know, sure, we get maybe a little tiny glimpse, but really, we are freaking blind here. I am comparatively blind to what I was when I was dead. There is so little that came back with me. Why do you think it was such a troubling thing to be here? Once you see Perry, you know, and all that, we too are pre existent. Some of us remember because we died and returned, and dare to publicly say so. Now, there are tens to 20 millions to 100, who knows how many all over the world. There's 10 to 20 in the old, in the old USA, and we sure need us now. Just like the whole world does. But some of us remember because we died and returned, and some of us dare to speak of it publicly. And I encourage all my NDE friends to speak publicly. Get an interview somewhere. Talk to a podcaster. Tell your friends. The more, the merrier. Others of us, they just remember their previous lives. Not just, okay. To rephrase that. Others of us remember their previous lives. Others have divine experiences of mystical portent when they have an experience of the visitation of the dead and their grief changes. From that point forward, they know their lover, their friend, their mother, whoever it is, isn't really dead, that they still live of what I'm trying to tell you, of what you can find inside yourself. More important than our incarnations, okay, this is, this is important to me, more important than our incarnations is our original self. Capital O, capital S, capital O, capital S. More important than any incarnation is our original. I do this all the time because when I was a kid, this is what the older people did to. Oh, you look at the little cheeks. Did you ever get that? I was like, ah. So I'm always doing this, okay? It's funny to me anyway. It's a reminder of my youth. My incarnational youth in this life. Because more important than any incarnation is our original self, the true, and that's a capital O and a capital S and a capital T, the, the true who we are, which is in between our incarnations. This is the self to focus on, the original self, because, because it's who you are. It's who we are. This original self is the true self. If your focus goes to there or into the divine, which there isn't a whole lot of difference between these two, they're so close, was and was with. 
This is the self to focus on. It's who we are. Like Jesus, we are pre-existent. Forgetting comes with incarnation, but many of us remember enough because we have experienced it. What do I mean by it? I mean the original self. Mystically, we have felt it, many, many of us, millions of us, and have found ourselves transformed. And in each transformation, in each mystical experience of any single kind that has lasting impact, that has after effects, a refocus of your vision and your perspective, what you see now is not what you saw before, well, when that happens, you're born again and again and again and again and again. Before Abraham was, I am, said Jesus in the Christian Bible. Before Abraham was, I am. There's the I am again, the I am, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to the Father, the Mother, the Divine Self the beloved, but through me, the I am is the, the narrow channel of your soul reconnected to the divine because it's who you are, your original self. This is truth. This is the truth of you and me and all humanity, all humanity in the chickadee and no, that's a goldfinch and the goldfinch right outside my window talking. Before Abraham was, before Adam was, I am. I say this, Peter Panagor, before Adam was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. You pre-exist. Even if you're a new soul, you pre-exist because of the oneness of being because that's your origin. I saw this, and I saw much more in heaven. Jesus said, if you exist as my disciples, here's the next part, and listen to my words with the ear of your heart, then the stones will minister to you. My name is Stone. My name is Rock. But that's not what he meant, okay? I just find that funny in the moment. My, anyway, even the rocks will minister to you, minister to you. So down here at, at, the, at one of the little tiny beaches, it's a stone beach, and there are uh, thousands of these small round stones. And when the tide comes into the certain level, it rolls the stone in this clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clickety, clickety-clack, tumbly-tumbly. And the, I stop every single time I go by there and just listen to the lapping waves and the rolling stones, and they minister to me because nature is speaking if I stop to listen. I live in a land of erratic boulders dropped by the glow glaciers. Maybe you do too. They go all the way down to Virginia, I think, maybe further south than that in the United States. These are big, huge stones that the, the glaciers pushed down during the last ice age or the ice age before that, because there were ice ages before that. They're a wonder to see. They are so huge and so heavy and they minister to me with the wonder of the world. But more than that, Jesus is saying that if you listen with the ear of your heart, everything vibrates with the presence of the divine, even stones, which are known to be very hard. Not just living things, all things that are things minister, meaning radiate, the panentheistic divine self whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. That's a quote, or mostly a quote. When you remember your original self, capital O, capital S, 
you will hear the stones singing. As you hear with the ear of your heart singing of the, the, of the living nature in plants and animals, in the songs of American goldfinches and other birds, even in their desperation, in the desert, on the ocean, in the plains, in the mountains, in a kitchen houseplant, wherever nature is, it sings to the heart who will listen. Why do you think they put trees in cities? Why would they do that? Why are there parks in concrete jungles? Why do people in neighborhoods plant gardens and pick stones and are happy for it? Because nature sings to those who have ears to hear. Jesus says, for you have, Jesus said, for you have five trees in paradise which do not change, either in summer or winter, and their leaves do not fall. You may not know this about tropical plants, but they drop their leaves. If you have tropical plants in your house or you live in the tropics or the subtropics, you know this is true. So these trees, these five trees in paradise, their leaves don't fall, either in winter or in summer. Once they don't change. One scholar, okay, so this is something that I had to, to use a lot other people to think about. So one scholar thinks, and I think this is a pretty good idea, one scholar thinks maybe f the five trees are the trunks and roots of our five senses on the other side. Maybe so. Maybe the five trees that are in paradise are our senses to see the other side. Now, this makes sense to me. Because I sense the divine with the ear of my heart, the eyes of my heart, the fingertips of my heart, the nose of my heart, the tongue of my heart. I feel it with my skin. I see it with my eyes. I hear it with my ears. Maybe these five, maybe that's what he was saying. Because, because I hear this not from here. It's not the rocks singing to me here that I hear. It's the rock. It's the divine in the rocks from over there that I hear. So I kind of hear it in the circuitous root from the origin of myself. I hope that makes sense. That maybe our five senses are the five trees. And it all makes total sense to me, or some sense to me anyway. In the woman's name, the scholar is Crystal McVeigh. No, no, I'm sorry. That's a mistake. The Crystal McVeigh, I want to quote somebody named Crystal McVeigh. She's an author um, of, a, of a new ebook, Crystal McVeigh which I haven't read, but I, I read some of. Waking Up in Heaven, this is the name of the book, Waking Up in Heaven, A True Story of Brokenness, Heaven, and Life Again. Waking Up in Heaven, A True Story of Brokenness, Heaven, and Life Again. No, she once said, Crystal McVeigh once said, I saw an immense brightness, a brightness I could feel, touch, taste, smell, that infused me, not like I had five senses, but like I had 500 senses. I concur, 500 senses. Like Jesus, she speaks for me. I carried back a unified single sensory perception. I see with my single eye, my single ear, my single touch, my single nose, my single taste through breath, and they're all the same sense. People ask me, do you see auras? Yes, I see them, but I feel them and hear them. It's this, not just this, this one sensory thing. They are all one. My senses are one when it comes to the divine, not when it comes to oregano or garlic or a fire. And then they're a little separate, but when it comes to the divine, they are one thing. Inside of me, those five senses in my mind, in my daily living, perceive the light as one single sense. So even the rocks speak. Jesus said, he, she, they, who knows. He, she, they, who knows the five. He, she, she they, who knows them shall not taste death shall not taste of death. By death, I think he means what my atheist friends believe, annihilation, no existence, the end of self, the end of living, the end of experience, 
and the end of being at death. We talked about that a little bit last weekend at the conference. And some folks expect annihilation at death. I mean, what's so bad about that? No more suffering, no more sense of self. People might want to be so attached to their beingness that they want to stay until maybe they get so old that they change their mind. And annihilation, obliteration becomes desirable for some folks. But some folks fear that. But Jesus knew. And I know. And tens of millions of near-death experience people like me and other kinds of mystics know through experience that death itself is tasteless. And yes, I planned that. It's like the, the, whole, the whole talk that I'm giving this morning, I wanted to use the word tasteless in a different sense. The tasteless thirst quench. The satisfying water of life ever after. The crystal river of life. And thus ends the fear of living and dying when you taste this. If I could, I would directly give to you what I see. And then you would know for yourself because that's how it works. You have to know for yourself. Every mystic is different. Every mystical experience is subjective. Every mystic experiences it for themselves, which is what the problem is with the language of metaphor. I'm not really angry, but it is a problem. If I could give it to you, I would. It works because it's in you already. But if you polish your lens, maybe with this group shaktipat, this group energy transference, maybe it'll help you polish your inner lens with the practice that you need. And if you do that, maybe if you feel it, that's my goal here, if you feel it, then maybe you'll experience your pre-existence, which is your original goodness at the core of the being of yourself, the golden light that I saw when I was dead. That's not sign language. That's universal sign language. And then may grace come of its own accord through practice and gift to you and transform you through the remembrance of your pre-existent divinity. Practice matters more than knowledge. Let's center for three breaths and maybe three ohms, three ohms and three, no, let's just do breath. Let's just center for three breaths together and uh, be sure to join us on Monday through Wednesday for our meditation sangha. Details below. Let's do three breaths. Thanks for being here this morning, 84 folks. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Let's close our eyes. Take some breaths. Practice matters more than knowledge. <sighs> Thanks for spending time with me this morning. 86 folks, peace and love. I'm so glad on this Sunday morning, wherever you are. Maybe you're staying inside in the United States from the heat. Maybe you're in Europe or in Thailand or in the UK. Um, Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for spending time with me as we explore the metaphorical, symbolic, and mystical teachings of the much misunderstood Jesus. Thanks for your financial support for this ambitious and global mission for mystical experiences worldwide. That's what Mystic Tea Salon actually is. This whole meditation, not church, it's all built to support Mystic Tea Salon the place where the community gathers to talk about mystical experiences. Thanks, Kitya, for that. To talk about their mystical experiences in a safe environment and where compassion, humility, and kindness are the keys. And those are the signs of higher level mystics everywhere. 
humble, compassionate, and kind. Being in the now. No matter the tradition, no matter the religion, or the NDE. So join me as I host Mystic Tea Salon, this private public forum, to continue and deepen our ongoing mystical exploration and conversations among mystical experiences worldwide. Zoom link below. You can call into these links for that. And we'll meet at the top of the next hour. Checking my clock down here. Spiritual consultations, counseling, and conversation, private sessions at peterpanagor.love. And I want to welcome a new Patreon patron, Kim. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us on Patreon this week, or I guess it was last week. Thanks. PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, and Patreon. PeterPanagor.love. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat section now or the comment section below. If they're in the comments, I'll, of course, talk, respond in a day or two. But um, in the chat section, it'd be easier for everybody now for me to see it. Uh, that doesn't even make sense, but yes. Okay, that's a funny sentence. All right. Um, it helps get the message out. Oh, please like the video. It helps get the message out. I'm reading, da reading David Ulrich. Please give the video a like. It helps get the message out. And if you haven't subscribed, that helps too. Thanks, David. Good to see you this week. Um, hello, Elaine. You're welcome. Hello, Asta. Uh, who thanks Beth. Welcome, Asta, first time. I'm glad you were here. Hi, everybody. Um, part of the whole deal here is that we are a community. You know, we're internet, uh, we're Facebook, not Facebook, but um, we have a Facebook, we do. But uh, you have to be connected to somebody to get in, it's private. Um, and you can't like friend me because I got 5,000 friends. No, you can't friend me. No, I have 5,000 friends. I have two, I can't, there's no room. Find somebody else. Hi, Ollie. You're welcome, Holly. Hi, T. Barb. Arte. Victoria. Hello. Uh, I wrote a whole message for you, Tim. Okay, you should see that, Tim. Words are a big problem for me, says Kitya. Trying to describe something when there are no words makes me appreciate conceptual language. Yeah, all language, all language. Okay, here's the thing about language: all language is conceptual conceptual because every single word is balanced by another word or five other words as you look it up in the dictionary it gives seven words in the definition it means this this and this it mostly means that those are ideas those are concepts that all, so all language each individual word hangs on the conceptual um, conceptualization of things in our lives that become other words and they support a single word and the whole thing is one big huge web of concepts and it's very difficult to talk about the thing, capital T, that has no thingness. Because everything that a conceptual word is based on is on a thing. And how do you talk about the thing that is no thing? The no thing. That's the problem. That is a problem. Uh, hi, Gertrude in Belgium. Welcome. Hi, Betty A. Energy coming to you loud and clear. Sight for sore eyes. A bomb for your heart. We magnify each other. Jesus knew this. He taught this. We can do this too. We magnify each other. Because you are this other thing, your original self. This is not, okay, it's a concept. Original, if you look up original, if you look up self, you look at all these words, that, but the book, a capital O, capital S, I'm indicating with those capital letters, I'm indicating with those capital letters, the idea that this is beyond language, but this is who you are and it is experiential and you can touch it and it does touch us to a small degree compared to heaven, for sure, a teeny tiny degree. Way too small for me here. <laughs> so frustrating. But if, not when I'm resting in it. When I'm resting in it, there's only peace. That's why I rest in it as often as I can. Hey, Nicola. Nicola in South Africa. Nice to see you. I know you didn't have put that up there, but I, I'm pretty sure that's where you are, unless you're somewhere else in the world right now. Nice to see you here. We are a global group of individual mystics. Every mystical mystic experience, every mystic is 
individual and every mystical experience is an, is an individual that makes every mystic different from every other mystic. What we all share in common is this unspeakable energy. This is the origin of ourself as we can feel it to some extent here. Of course, it gets more intense. It gets much more intense. This is just the beginning of it. Do you want to experience it? You will. I promise you, you will. In this life, I don't know. Maybe, hopefully. But I promise you, you will experience this to a million septillion times in quality and quantity in death. Because, you know, there is no death. There's only transition. Um, language is magical, but it's really like the Tao that cannot be named is the real Tao. This is, this is the problem. You, you exactly said so, Holly. This is the universal problem of mystical language. It's not just Jesus stumbling over his words. It's the Tao. It's Chuangzu. It's Lao Tzu. It's uh, Rumi. It's Hafez. It's Kafir. It's Teresa of Avila. It's everybody. It's Native American wisdom. It's, it's, it's shamanistic wisdom. It's everybody. Everybody has this problem. It's about time we talk about that too. The more we talk about metaphor and symbol, the more likely literalism, of course, there is such a thing as science, and that's going to pull apart, deconstruct literalism in the 21st century if, if we, if hopefully science is real, people, um, and, and, and literalism is not, and neither is the mind, well, the mindset that goes along with it's real, but Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. Um, definitely. That's the problem. And, and the Tao is telling the truth. The Tao that can be named is not the Tao, which is, which gets to the other saying, and here I am contradicting this right now in the very moment that I'm saying it, he who speaks does not know. And he who knows does not speak. But I don't, can't keep my mouth shut. Cause you can't say it. T Barb. Um, I had a dream. Angels were joyfully creating miracles, saying they are easy and fun. They told me they want us to remember who we are and how powerful we are. We are the I am. We are. Blessed are those angels who came to teach you. We are the I am. That's the thing. That is no thing, which is the thing. Kristen, I am mystic enough to know what's true, but I have feet of clay because I am angered by those who advance a limited picture. A limiting picture. Yes, well, you know, my feet are made of clay too, which is a biblical reference. People, idols made of clay, whose feet can smash, and then the, the statue falls over. Okay, that's the reference here. Yeah, I have feet of clay too, um, but I, I... Ultimately, all's well, but in the world, if we want the truth to be known we have to say it we have to say it and we have to counterbalance these other ideas we don't have to fight about it this whole conference a bunch of a bunch of atheists no a couple of atheists wanted to like get in a an argument i'm like eh, i'm not gonna argue i don't really care um i i, I care enough that i want to see it deconstructed but I don't care enough to get angry about it, Kristen. Um, I think it's destructive and, and I would fight against it if it comes to some terrible thing. And I'm just going to stop there. But I know you're angry about it. It's okay to be angry. May that give you motivation to speak. Um, you know, anger isn't all that bad. What? Aren't you supposed to go beyond anger, Peter? Well, I've seen so many women who've been in abusive situations that the only thing that got them out and keeps them protected is their anger that gives them the fortitude and the strength to drive forward. It's not also it's not all bad. We have human emotions. I know the people who infect the thinking the evangelical literalists who infect the thinking process are dangerous people to community, to inclusiveness, to humanism, to our own unity, to the divine. It has no threat to that, but it does threaten the people. May peace 
flow like a river through so many hearts that the I am overpowers the me, me, me of the world. That's my prayer. That's my hope. That's what I want to see happen. May it be so. Yeah, what a great dream. I agree, Asta. Emotions can give us power to make change. They do things for good. They are part of the mechanisms of operating our human as humans. Uh, yeah, as we say over here in Maine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Main main thing. Yeah, yeah. It means yes. And and the, another saying for you, Asta, is that's the finest kind, which means it's the most true and highest. That's the finest kind, that dream. All right, hearts. Excited and looking forward to Mystic Tea, says Tim. The link is below. We've been here 41. I know that YouTube likes the videos shorter. People like to watch them more likely. I'm really glad you people came this week. Okay, so I have a lot of schedule coming up, and I should let you know. Um, I my, we're, There's some things going on in our house, which means that we have to get out of our house for a week. Um, I can't work up in the mountains where my wife is going with the spears. This is TBI, right? So I'm going to stay in my brother's place on Cape Cod for a week. And um, I may, I'll be working from the Cape um, somewhere around after August 3rd. And then for a couple of weeks after Labor Day, I'm going to be, of course, I'm going to be speaking at in Salt Lake City um, as a featured speaker, but also as the MC at the International Association for Near-Death Studies, which is a 40-year-old, we're celebrating our 40th year, 40-year-old um, science-based university-affiliated research project that looks at near-death experience. And it's its big conference. It's You can go to ians.org, I-N-D-A-I-N-I-A-N-I-A-N-D-S, I-N-D-S.org and find a link to the conference there. It's attendable by Zoom. It's attendable in person. I'm the MC, the master, the master of ceremonies. I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to, well, I'm going to do my job. That's what I'm going to do and have fun while I'm doing it if I can. Anyway, I'm going to be out there and then I'm going to um, go meet my producers in L.A. So at one of those weeks, uh, I'll probably in mid-September, I may or may not have a video up because I'm going to be meeting with my producers. Nah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. All right, my friends. Um, I'll see you, Sean, in Salt Lake City. Um, nice to meet you, Asta. Thank you for the heart, Ellen. Um, video and chat clear for you in South Africa. Very excellent to hear. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Peter, you do so much with your life. Thank you. Well, you know, I only got so much time. I got so much time. Unlike Willy Wonka, so much time and so little to do. I mean, the opposite of Willy Wonka. There's so little time and so much to do. Let's do it all together. Community. Hey, Chris, and uh, thank you from North Hollywood. Well, wicked nice out there in North Hollywood. Holly, love these not church meetings are inspirational, great for the conversation. Yeah, Robert, hey Robert, thanks for bringing all that stuff in early in the conversation and thanks for the dream and somebody else was participating a lot in the conversation today. Thanks everybody for having that, making it a super chat over there um, with, well, that's what the thing about this. Okay, last word, I'm trying to get off, but I'm doing a bad job of it. Mystic Tea Salon and not church are community sourced wisdom through mystical experience. That's what I want. Community sourced wisdom through mystical experience. I don't want, okay, that's what I want. No, I want this because I want to learn from you. Y'all carry the light. Let's share it together. That's where it gets magnified. Hey, Paul in the Netherlands, light in Netherlands and Susan in Seattle uh, and brother Rob, hey, Rob in Wales and brother Ed in, um, over there in Oklahoma. Or are you in? You're in that section of Oklahoma that has a different name by itself, like Texacloma or Oklatexahoma or something like that. I'm sorry, brother, but good to see you here. 
Suzanne in North Carolina. All right, I'm going to go. I got 15 minutes or 14 minutes. I'll talk to you later. Top of the hour, Mystic Tea Salon, link below. See you soon. Peace and love. Namaste. Thanks for being here. Peter Panacor, love.